broiling sun still sends temperatures over the 100 degree mark in Oklahoma before it dips into a heat shimmered horizon to paint one more beautiful sunset. The sounds of a great state are silhouetted against that summer sun, and some of them are sounds of the past. The sound of a rough and ready boom town getting tuned up for a Saturday night. sound of a backwoods whiskey still being pounded into oblivion by the sheriff. And there is the sound of the wind restlessly sighing itself to sleep in the twilight, moving an eddy of dust to make its bed. It is the wind of the present, but of the immemorial past too, and on it ride the voices of the past. Only a grain of sand has run through history's hourglass since the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Creek Indians ruled this territory, maintaining diplomatic relations with the United States. And while their governments are gone, the voices of their past are still here. But there are other paths which stand mute and silent over the Oklahoma landscape at sunset. Economic and cultural ghosts, which for all their lack of substance, are very real. There is the ghost of the oil booms. This was one of the biggest. And there are the outlaws. Just yesterday, the Daltons, the Doolins, Tulsa Jack, Catalani, and Bonnie Parker hid from lawmen in the hidden ravines of Oklahoma. And now, they are gone. Only yesterday, thousands of cattle moved along the Chisholm Trail to Kansas. The Chisholm Trail is still there, but the bawling herds are fenced now, and the trail is silent in the dusk. The landmarks of a rich and exciting past are everywhere in Oklahoma. One might expect that such a past would obscure the future, but in Oklahoma today, it has distorted even the present. Even for those who have been Okies, all their lives. It's become too easy to talk about the drought and ignore the state's 1,200 square miles of lakes, the 144,000 acre Lake Texoma, one of the largest bodies of water between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico, or our own Eufaula Reservoir, now filling out a shoreline of more than 200 miles. There are others, Ten Killer, Grand Lake of the Cherokees, Lugert, Roman Nose, Ulaga a sea of inland water spread across the face of the Oklahoma prairie. There are still too many who remember Steinbeck's Dust Bowl migrations, but who don't know that Greer County had the nation's first belt of trees planted to guard against blowing dust, or that the first upstream watershed conservation project in the U.S. was built in Roger Mills County. A few Oklahomans still live in lonely rural towns, skylined only with deserted buildings and empty service stations standing guard over wide deserted streets. But these are changing. The backward towns are dying, while the progressive, active small towns are growing, a never-ending civic process. Most of the people have moved to the modern bustling cities, large and small, Oklahoma City, Enid, Lawton, Bartlesville, Tulsa. And there are the people, stereotypes of the past, until you look at them more closely. This is today, this is the present, and this is a glimpse of tomorrow in Oklahoma. Star Man.
Manufacturing Company, manufacturers of steel buildings for commerce, industry, and agriculture presents Tomorrow Belongs to Oklahoma. that the magic of Babson's magic circle can be generated in their home state. The state's natural resources have produced $16 billion worth of minerals in the state's short history. While the nation has been able to produce oil in only one-tenth of one percent of its total land area, Oklahoma continues to produce oil in 70 of its 77 counties. And Oklahoma contains the country's richest soil and has the largest untapped water supply. Oklahomans have recently learned also to look beyond the trees to see their forests, $50 million worth a year. 10 million acres of forest lands grow a greater variety of native trees than found in all of Europe. Yet the state is producing only 25% of its potential. And down in southeastern Oklahoma lies an even greater potential. Here in the hills, noted mostly for their scenic beauty, under the feet of a population generally thought to be mostly on relief, lies a treasure house of coal, high quality coal in tremendous quantity, waiting only for low freight rates and an expanding industry. Babson wrote of markets at the globe. Oklahoma's general store carries a wider range of goods today, with state workers turning out airplanes and parking meters, helicopters and grocery carts, air conditioners and boats, brassiers and baby foods, to serve not only the 42 million buyers with their $81 billion a year buying power in the state's market area, but the world as well. Babson also spoke of Oklahoma's worker when he said the Magic Circle ranks first in effective manufacturing manpower per capita over any section in the United States. Oklahoma's worker is special. To new industry moving in, he is money saved, progress made, and profit earned. As one official of a new firm said, our company would have saved $500,000 in labor costs in 1962 if workers at the company's other plants had been as efficient as those in the Oklahoma plant. These are the men who are working the state's multi-million dollar petrochemical processing plants at more than a dozen refineries and a new gas processing plants. They work at the largest helium plant in the world. They help develop new glass plants at Henrietta and nine other cities. They are the men who turn Oklahoma natural resources into man-made wealth as new industry moves into the state's new industrial frontier. But Babson's magic circle was only a dream for Oklahoma's dirt farmers in the 30s. There was little magic about grubbing out the next cotton crop while watching the corn burn on sun-brown stalks. And the dream became a nightmare when the drought turned to dust. The dust became a depression. And then, just as Oklahoma was winning the battle for survival, a new disaster struck. A disaster that was to plant the seed of a new era. The disaster struck in 1943, when spring rains brought a 500-mile flood of destruction raging through the valley of the Arkansas River. It was the 70th time in 30 years that the river had gone out of control. After the floodwaters receded came the cleanup, directed by Oklahoma's newly inaugurated governor, Robert S. Kerr. It was then that Kerr learned of a plan designed years before by the Army engineers. The plan called for a series of dams, which would prevent the recurring floods and allow man to use the Arkansas water. Kerr also remembered that years before, the Arkansas River had been navigable and that there had been a plan to make the Arkansas navigable again. Here was the key to Oklahoma's becoming a vastly powerful economic giant within inland America. And the key had been uncovered by a water-swept disaster and placed in the hands of a man who through the coming years proved capable of turning that key to the future. 
Kerr saw that Oklahoma had long suffered from two major drawbacks, lack of dependable water where it was needed most, and a freight rate hump that was too great for most industries. The Arkansas River project involves an engineering feat greater than the construction of the Panama Canal or the TVA. The project is $200 million larger than the St. Lawrence Seaway. Yet, despite the cost, the mammoth investment will more than pay for itself in one generation. The opening of the Arkansas will give this area every factor which has gone into the Ruhr and Ohio Valleys, the richest industrial areas the world has ever known. But the Arkansas River is endowed with a wealth and variety of resources unknown to either the Ruhr or Ohio. The economists are beginning to understand the Babson prediction that the magic circle may well become the richest area in the history of civilized man. The Doughboys were a job with the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, though he had no idea what a Chamber of Commerce was supposed to do. He soon found that it was to build a community, and that was his specialty. We want you to underwrite today, three million dollars, before we leave this room today. Now, I'm going to leave that with you while it's so keen, uh, that you can let your conscience be your guide, not, not, not my conscience be your guide, but yours. Because it's your, it's your name we're going to borrow money on. And all we're asking, as we have you before, is to borrow your credit for a deal. With an inexhaustible energy, he combined a great dream, many dreams, actually, all of them dreams of the growing Oklahoma City metropolitan area. And over the years, most of those dreams have become reality. Tinker Air Force Base, a giant base serving the world and providing materiel backup for those globe-girdling forces of defense. It wasn't even supposed to be built in Oklahoma City until Draper and company went to work. When Draper first came to Oklahoma City, the first paved highway in the state was under construction. He dreamed of major expressways shuttling traffic through the city. Today, an expressway across downtown Oklahoma City is being laid on stilts 35 feet high. The high-speed traffic artery bears his name, and Oklahoma City stands at the center of a nationwide highway system. And it isn't by accident that Oklahoma City's Will Rogers World Airport is surrounded by wide acres of empty land, land to protect airport approaches and provide for industrial expansion. Will Rogers Field is larger than Washington, D.C. Dulles International or New York City's Kennedy, and already the city ranks third in the nation in tonnage of air cargo arriving and departing. It expects to become the air cargo capital. But these are dreams of the past to Draper. What of the dreams of the future? Like Babson and Kerr, Draper foresees a giant industrial valley spreading up the Arkansas River and into central Oklahoma. Huge industries will grow along the route of cheap inland water transportation. Draper foresaw this. He was among the first to envision water transportation into central Oklahoma. The Oklahoma City Chamber initiated a full-time study of water conservation in the 1920s and gave the nation the idea for comprehensive flood control by upstream damming. The Central Oklahoma Canal will soon link landlocked Oklahoma City to the world markets. It will open the city to the greatest flow of trade imaginable, if you can dream. Draper dreams of 94,000 new homes built in Oklahoma City within the next 10 years, of today's churches growing from 630 to at least 950 to meet requirements of the population in the 70s. Food sales will climb in Oklahoma City from less than $200 million today to more than $333 million by the 1970s. With barges linking the state to the sea and its ships, Oklahoma will become a truly international state, and there will be other ships, supersonic transports. Draper's dreaming has helped make Will Rogers World Airport one of the first in the nation capable of handling the coming speedy planes. Now he dreams of a vast complex of warehouses at the field, ready to hold the goods of the nation duty-free, awaiting shipment to markets throughout North America.
With the water projects have come great dams, and there will be others. Through them, not only navigation, but a dependable water supply. Draper's Dreaming helped build a pipeline 100 miles from southeast Oklahoma to Oklahoma City, which now pours the precious water into city mains. But as industry arrives and population grows, so grows demand for water, and it must be met. Draper envisions a population of one million for Oklahoma City in the year 2000. For them, the water will provide also recreation. The dream is not a fantasy. It is reality, projected over a short period of time when Oklahoma City must provide more jobs, additional parks and playgrounds, cultural stimulation, and modern municipal facilities. And there must be provisions for outsiders as well. Draper dreams of the day when tourists will make Oklahoma a destination instead of a place through which to drive on the road to somewhere else. Thousands of tourists will flock to the Oklahoma lakes, more famous than Minnesota's, and located in the middle of the expanding nation, more accessible. Draper was an early supporter of the frontiers of science and still believes that a higher learning complex will develop in the central part of the state. Students enrolled in one university or college will commute to another campus. By interchange and cooperation, tomorrow's youngsters will have the best offered by each university, a program of educational greatness. It is a dream, but as Draper says, knowledge creates understanding and transforms dreams into reality. This is a true story. It actually happened. The place, a small town in eastern Oklahoma. The time, a few months ago. Two men in a convertible pulled into the local service station. They looked like the ordinary kind of traveling salesmen. They were traveling, but they were buying, not selling. The product they sought was a location for a new industrial plant. The men were professional business scouts, trained to sort out the good communities from the bad communities, from a business point of view. They had been to Texas, and they were on their way to Arkansas after several visits in Oklahoma. Howdy, nice what can I do for you? Uh, fill it up regular, please. All righty. Say, we've been driving around here. Looks like you've got a nice little town. Oh, I tell you one thing. You certainly tell you're a stranger to this here town. We're strangers here. Why? What kind of a town is it? Oh, this ain't much of a town. Wind blows all the time. Politicians always arguing with one another. You don't get along? Uh... Oh, they're squabblers, just squabblers. Had a new fella move in here and wanted to clean my place up and everything. Said it'd help business, but business been slow for two or three years, and I don't figure painting nothing's gonna help any. Business, I'll tell you that. business pretty bad, huh? Terrible. It's just terrible. You fellas from out of the state, are you? Yeah, we're just traveling through, looking around. Yeah, the further you can get out of this town, the better off you'll be. I'll tell you one thing we got to be proud of in this town, oh, though. What's that? Well, for the last seven years, they've been trying to get a bond issue across. But we've all got together and defeated every dead gum one of them. <laughs> you beat them? Beat them, just beat them right out, beat them. Hello, Miss Sam, how are you? Yeah, check that. Uh, you got those down there? They're going to be interested in what we found out here. That'll be three dollars, please. Uh, okay, just a minute here. So you, uh, voted all your bond issues down, huh? Sure did, boy. Not much business going on. You know what I'll say? How's that? I'll say if it's good enough for Grandpa, it's good enough for us. Yeah, okay. Thank well, you all. You're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate all you thought to. Listen, uh, I think we better get out of here and check that town out in Arkansas. This doesn't right. look too good. I Thanks agree. a lot. An Oklahoman once said, if we were California, we'd be known for nothing but Death Valley. Now whose fault is that? The next opportunity to sell Oklahoma is breaking on our shores like the ever-increasing supply of water. The future does belong to Oklahoma, but it must be claimed.
Now here is the author of the book, Tomorrow Belongs to Oklahoma, Mr. Ray Ackerman. This is a land being shaped by its people and the people who move in daily. The mold is formed for the future, but it is pliable, waiting only for further shaping by men with new ideas. Oklahoma is growing. Youngsters already here are on the ground floor of a future that is virtually unlimited. Newcomers pouring into the state are finding room for development in a climate that is anything but static and stagnant. Newcomers find an opportunity quickly to mold their future and the future of the state. As a New York theater critic summed it up recently, Oklahoma's cultural future is more exciting than that found elsewhere because ours is just now being formed, whereas others are locked on course. Let's be impatient for tomorrow. The time for quiet building is over. It's time to shout, to wave the flag, to sing Oklahoma at public gatherings. It's time to tell the world about this place. While Oklahoma has been spending less than $30,000 a year to advertise its industrial advantages, New Mexico has been spending 200,000, Louisiana 300,000, and Florida has topped the million dollar mark. The city of Dallas alone spends nearly $50,000 a year to advertise its industrial assets. Up till this time, the burden of advertising the state of Oklahoma has been borne by such companies as Oklahoma Gas and Electric, Oklahoma Natural Gas Company, and the public service company of Tulsa. But local organizations need to get started too, and individuals. Every Oklahoman should sell the state, whether it's in a conversation with a passing tourist or a letter to a friend. As one Oklahoman once put it, We've always known we were great, but there were times when we were too sick to talk about it. Well, it's time to begin talking. Our history, our resources, the beliefs of men like Babson, Kerr, Draper, and you and me in Oklahoma and its potential justifies our pride and our self-confidence. Tomorrow Belongs to Oklahoma was presented by Star Manufacturing Company. Manufacturers of steel buildings for commerce, industry, and agriculture.